I will arise and go now, for always, night and day, I hear lake water lapping with low sounds by the shore. When I stand on the roadway or on the pavement's grey, I hear it in the deep heart's core. Lot Gill and County Sligo may not have quite the same appeal for you as it did for W.B. Yeats, but his poem about Innisfree strikes a chord. Where is your happy place? Where would you have peace? You may not think in terms of bean rows and a hive for the honeybee, or maybe you do, but you probably have some dream of life as it should be. Your ideal home. What's yours like? One of the Psalms in the Bible paints a picture of an ideal home. It's one of the songs of ascents, a song for going up. The Psalm mentions Jerusalem. It probably was used by people on their way there to the temple on Mount Zion for one of the annual times of festivity. And the Psalm is a happy song. It celebrates a blessing. Let me read its lyrics to you. Actually, it would be a help if you had its words before you. Could you open a Bible at Psalm 128? Find Psalm 128 and listen as I read this song of ascents from verse 1. This is the word of God. It says, Blessed are all who fear the Lord, who walk in obedience to him. You will eat the fruit of your labour. Blessings and prosperity will be yours. Your wife will be like a fruitful vine within your house. Your children will be like olive shoots round your table. Yes, this will be the blessing for the man who fears the Lord. May the Lord bless you from Zion. May you see the prosperity of Jerusalem all the days of your life. May you live to see your children's children. Peace be on Israel. And with that prayer for peace, we reach the end of Psalm 128. It is a happy little song, isn't it? But it puts across a very earnest plea. I want to share that plea with you. But first, let's turn to the Lord in prayer. Let's pray. Most blessed, most glorious, ancient of days, Lord, you are the one from whom all blessings flow. You're the father of lights, from whom comes every good and perfect gift. And now we ask for your kindness, O God. You have given us ears to hear. Let us hear what you are saying to us. You have given us hearts to love. Let us not harden them. Open them to your truth. You gave your son to be the saviour of the world. You have sent your spirit to draw people to him in faith. Oh, work in us now, three-personed God. Make your word effectual in our lives. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And maybe you're wondering where that earnest plea is in Psalm 128. The song ends with a prayer for peace upon Israel, but that's not the plea it directs toward me and you. No, the plea emerges as we take in all that this psalm presents to us. Look at it with me. Pick up first of all on the promise the psalm proclaims. Look at the promise in verse 1 and verse 4. Do you see it there? Both of these verses pr promise God's blessing. Blessed are all who fear the Lord, every single one of them, verse 1. And this will be the blessing for the man who fears the Lord, verse 4. Both verses promise blessing. Both verses promise blessing, but they actually use two different words. One points to the state of blessedness and the other to the status of the blessed. Verse 1 has the word that tells of the state of blessedness. Sometimes it's translated as happy. It speaks of the good to be expected or what the blessing gives. And Psalm 128 does paint a picture of that. We'll come to it in a minute. First, though, let me say that verse 4 has the other word for blessing, the one that speaks of the status of the blessed. It points to the grace that is extended or why the blessing is given. The same word is used again in verse 5 when it says, May the Lord bless you. And that really is the biggest thing to grasp about the promise here. There are two words that both mean blessed, but they both point to the one blesser, if there is such a word. The blessing comes from God. 
The Lord promises the good. The Lord promises his grace. We're talking about the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. That's what Psalm 128 promises. It may help if we think in terms of opposites for a moment. Sometimes the easiest way to explain what you mean is to talk about its opposite. You say, turn that key the other way. Or you might complain that there is no light in the cellar. When you say there's no light, you mean that it's dark. But you're using the opposite to get the thought across. So what's the opposite of blessing? Well, it's cursing, isn't it? So the promise of God's blessing means ultimately no more curse. Every blessing bestowed here and now, every grant of good, every gift of grace is like a ray of sunlight bursting through the cloud and pointing to what will be. Every blessing is like the first light of dawn chasing away the blackness of the night. It's a ray of hope. It's a sign of what is to come. It's a bit of the future here and now. It's a promise. Now, do you see what I'm saying? The Bible tells us how, in the beginning, our first parents fell from the estate in which they were created. All humankind lost communion with God and came under his wrath and curse. But like many Psalms and other passages of the Bible, this song for going up proclaims God's blessing, not his curse. It holds out a promise. So do you see the plea of Psalm 128 yet? Well, let's pick up on something else that points to it. I said that the psalm gives us a picture of the blessing promised, a picture of the good to be expected. Let's pick up that picture next. You'll find it in verse 3, uh, the verse that paints the scene of a happy home. Uh, do you see it there? Now, we know that this is a picture. It's an illustration. We know that because verse 4 says, yes, this will be the blessing. Uh, what that means is the blessing comes in a way like this. Your Bible may have something like, Behold, thus shall the man be blessed. That thus, a verse 4, indicates that verse 3 is for illustrative purposes. The actual details may vary for different individuals. This is a picture. So do what you're supposed to do in an art gallery. Look at the picture for a minute and take in what you see. Well, I'm guessing that's what you're supposed to do in an art gallery. I have to confess that I'm not in one very often. But look at the picture here in verse 3. Take in what you see. Well, there's a happy family here. I'm not talking about the little card game you play with the children where you look for Mr. Bun the baker and all the rest. The picture here is of husband and wife and parents and children held together in a bond of love. The children are around the table. They're not sulking in their rooms or finding excuses to stay away from home. Husband and wife work together, fruitfully. She feels no need to look elsewhere for affection and consideration. Do you see the picture? Now, not every person gets married. The Lord gives some the gift of singleness. And not every couple has children. But it may be that you look at the picture here and you compare your own home life to it, and you sort of see a resemblance, but yours is nowhere near as good as this. It's not ideal. Someone has spoiled it. It's very easy to start to point the finger, isn't it? But you are not without fault either, are you? We all sin, even against those we love the most. The picture here, though, points to a redeeming and a healing of relationships. Can you imagine it? What would it be like if our selfishness and silliness, our stubbornness and spitefulness didn't make a mess of things? Well, that would be a blessing indeed. And the picture is yet more to show. The imagery of vine and olive shoots suggests both a settled and untroubled land and the proper conditions for flourishing. House and table speak of security and provision. So no war, no calamity, no droughts, no floods, 
no disease. Do you get the picture? Do you see the idea? And do you pick up on the plea in Psalm 128? The promise in the psalm points you to its plea. It promises blessing. The picture in the psalm points you to its plea. It pictures a sweet and blessed country, to quote the hymn, where from Kerr released the shout of them that triumph, the song of them that feast. But as well as promise and picture, pick up on the prayer of the psalm. The prayer also points you to its plea. Now, the prayer may not be immediately obvious in your Bible translation. If you look at verses 5 and 6, your Bible may say, the Lord shall bless. The original Hebrew words here could be taken that way. They could be stating a fact or they could be expressing a wish. I think this is more likely and that we're to understand the Psalms last two verses as a prayer. May the Lord bless you from Zion. May you see the prosperity of Jerusalem. And the prayer continues to the final words, peace be upon Israel. And the prayer points to the plea of Psalm 128. The prayer takes a little unpicking. You have a very clear petition right at the end though, peace be upon Israel. Israel is one of the Bible's names for the people of God. In the days before the Lord Jesus came to live, die and rise as the Redeemer, God's people almost exclusively were physical descendants of a man called Jacob, the grandson of Abraham. They were the children of Israel. God's people still are. They are the spiritual children who share in the blessing that God promised to and through Abraham. They are those who share by faith in the blessing that comes through the Lord Jesus. And the prayer for peace upon Israel here is a prayer that the fullness of this blessing would be given. That's the last petition. Just before it, there is a request for both quality and quantity of life in this world. Singing the psalm means praying for God's blessing on one another. It has us asking the Lord to give that blessing every single day. That's the quality of life. And it has us asking for a quantity of life that you get to see your children's children. Now again, that never applies to each and every individual. But you take the point. The psalm prays for a long and happy life. But that brings us to how the prayer begins in verse 5. May the Lord bless you. It sounds so simplistic, doesn't it? It's like the prayer of a little child. God bless mummy. God bless daddy. Make the bad people good and the good people nice. God bless is the sort of phrase people use as a sign off. A general best wishes. A vague benediction. If that's all there is to it, you can see why a man once swapped the blessing for a bowl of soup. But look at the prayer again. May the Lord bless you from Zion. May you see the prosperity of Jerusalem. This is so much more than best wishes for a long and happy life. The prayer looks for sunlight, not moonbeams. Moonbeams offer a pale reflection of the true source of light. And in this world, many people do get them. They get to enjoy God's common grace. Their lives are long. Their bodies are healthy. They look back over the road taken and they see that they were blessed. What more could you ask for? Well, the prayer here asks for more. It looks for sunlight, not moonbeams. It prays for the full light of God's blessing. Zion represents God's people under God's promise. The good or the prosperity of Jerusalem is the Lord's presence among his own. Verse 5 answers the question that Psalm 128 raises. Why should any man, woman or young person be blessed? When we all have sinned and deserve God's wrath and curse, why should any one of us feel the light and warmth of his love? But the festivals in Zion reminded the people that the Lord had redeemed them. He had taken them to be his own. 
The temple in Jerusalem reminded the people that the Lord provided atonement for their sin. It was the place of sacrifice. The temple was where the lamb died so that the people could live. It bore the curse so that they could receive the blessing. And all those offerings pointed to the one true sacrifice to the Lamb of God. This song for going up says, May the Lord bless you from Zion. We now understand that as, May the Lord bless you because of Jesus. May you enjoy God's grace and goodness because of him. That's the prayer here in Psalm 128. And that prayer points you to the Psalm's plea. Just before I get to it though, could I ask you to notice one implication of what I've just said? I talked about moonbeams and sunlight and how many enjoy a happy and blessed life in this world without ever coming to see the source of every blessing. The real fount of every blessing is God. To have peace with him through the Lord Jesus Christ is to rejoice with hope in the glory of God. What I want you to notice then is that there is a deeper, fuller, richer joy to be had in standing in grace than there ever is in sitting in clover. Where is your happy place? Even if your outward circumstances are awful, Christian, take heart. Find your joy in the Lord always. I'll say that again. Rejoice. But let me come back to the plea of Psalm 128. The song asks something of us. Its promise and picture and prayer all point us to ponder God's blessing. And the psalm proclaims that the Lord blesses each one who fears him and who walks in obedience to him. Do you see what it wants you to do? Fear the Lord. And walk in obedience to him. That's the path of blessing. It's the basis of peace. And it's the plea of Psalm 128. Fear the Lord. Entire books have been written about what it means to fear the Lord. Whole sermons have taken it as their theme. I'm just pointing out this. Uh, this is the plea of Psalm 128. And I need to be brief. Uh, but let me say this. Fear goes right to the core of your being. It's much more than how you think about something. It involves heart and strength as well as mind. And the fear of the Lord is an awe-filled, loving response to him. To spell it out, fear is a fully engaged, adoring reverence. Fear is what consumes our hearts when we truly see the Lord revealed in Jesus Christ. You see sovereignty and power, majesty and justice, goodness and truth. You see purity and compassion, righteousness and mercy. You see holy love. And when with marvelling faith and trembling joy, you receive God's forgiveness and love in Jesus, it leads you to a fully engaged, adoring reverence. How could you do anything else? You have to fear the Lord. Do you? I'll look again to Jesus. Think once more of his laying down his life for sinners. Think of how God planned it, that Christ should become the curse so that we might receive the blessing. Dwell on his love. Think upon his sacrifice. Cast your mind to Calvary. Focus your eyes on him. Turn round your life to him. It is time to fear the Lord. And that fully engaged, adoring reverence will be seen in your life, won't it? If you fear the Lord, you will walk in obedience to him. Faith will show itself in action. And why? Well, Psalm 128 tells you why. God's word here issues its invitation. It calls you to fear the Lord and walk in his ways. It holds out hope for this life and for that which is to come. Hear its plea. Blessed are those who fear the Lord. And let us pray. 
Lord Almighty, you have declared that you are a great king and that your name is to be feared among the nations. May we be those who fear you. Oh, help us to work out our salvation with fear and trembling, since you work in us to will and to act according to your good purpose. Keep us in your fear, O oh Lord. Then we will have nothing else to fear. Help us fix our eyes on you. You be our vision. And according to your word, O oh God, grant us your blessing. The blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. May it rest upon and abide with us all, now and forevermore. Amen. Now, in that prayer and in all that I said on Psalm 128, I quote it from several hymns. Some of these are in the playlist that goes along with this ministry. You can use those songs to lift your praise to God. And if you're able, do come along and join with us in our church meeting house. We gather as Donna Cloney Presbyterian Church each Sunday morning at half past eleven. Join with us as we come together through Christ in faith before God under his word and around his throne. But may you, through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, know God's grace and mercy and peace. And may you live in his love in the days ahead.